Okay. Um, thank you for coming this evening to the, to the ITR Digital History Seminar. Um, I'm really delighted about this evening because when we were planning our programme for the year, we really wanted a kind of panel, we wanted to do ethics, and we had people who wanted to ask, and all those people said yes, which, was, which is always excellent. Um, so we've got four speakers this evening. Um, we've got um, Catherine Eccles from the Oxford Internet Institute, which I tend to always call the OYI, but you know, um, who's working on some projects at the moment about VR and AR and stuff like that. And I don't know if that's exactly what you're going to talk about today, but it may kind of drift in at some point. Um, Kelly Foster is a public historian I know through her work on Wikimedia in particular, uh, but is also a founding member of Transmission, a collective of archivists and historians of African descent. Um, one of my colleagues from the University of Sussex, Sharon Webb, um, who um, has some grants at the moment, I won't see what they are, but we'll probably talk about them in the course of what she's going to say about ethics, um, but is a lecturer in uh, digital humanities at Sussex. Um, and um, Gillian Nyan, who's um, in information studies at UCL, associate prof, and you are the co-director, no, deputy director at UCL. Correct. So, um, a couple of notices before we start. One is that we do have a live stream going this evening. Um, I don't know your name, sorry, but try not to knock our device, if possible. Um, <laughs> no pressure involved. <laughs> no pressure involved. Um, hopefully that won't change the tone of the conversations and questions at the end, but just to make you aware. And we usually have one question or so from online uh, at some point, which we'll be monitoring, I believe Neil will probably be monitoring that. Um, I'm going to ask all the speakers to speak for about between 10 to 15 minutes. I'm sort of waving them off about 10 minutes. And then after we've finished, we will have a kind of more general discussion hopefully, about the themes around ethics and digital history. So um, we're going to go Catherine, Julianne, Kelly, Kelly was not going to last, <laughs> and Sharon. Yeah. Thanks, James. Um, so I'm delighted to be um, asked to come and speak on this panel, but also very frightened. <laughs> and I think that's probably a common feeling that a lot of people have when they're having to think about ethics. It's something that's so cool to what we do, but it's very hard to talk about and to plan for. And so I was sort of frightened and thrilled to have an opportunity to really think about the ethics in a more formal way. Um, so I am um, a historian by training, but I work in a place called the Oxford Internet Institute, which is a multidisciplinary institute for studying life online. Um, I'm broadly interested in public and scholarly engagement with historic materials, so mostly museums and cultural heritage. Um, but actually, that's not really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so one of the reasons I really like working at the OII is there's an awful lot of talking about ethics and thinking about ethics. So we have a digital ethics lab, for example, um, led by my colleague Luciana Floridi and lots of ethicists working with us. Um, and that makes me feel like we're very answerable to those um, questions. Um, and it's, it's really helpful when you're working with um, sort of cutting edge technologies and a very sort of fast moving methodological environment to have people who are also trying to grapple with those changes at the same time. Um, so I feel like it's quite an agile research culture in that way. Um, so I guess my first point was to say, you know, surround yourself with colleagues who have similar dilemmas to you, because I think it's in dialogue with um, people working on similar sorts of data or similar questions that you find the clearest way forward. So I don't have their expertise, I'm not in the digital ethics lab, um, but I do have some experience from projects I've worked on over the last couple of years, and I thought I'd just quickly uh, walk you through a couple. So, um, this, that's the Oxford Internet Institute spread across three sites so. um, so my two examples are a project we just wrapped up um, on the Everyday Sexism project, um, and a new project we just started called Hashtag Heritage. Um, so these ha have and continue to give us a lot of headaches in terms of the ethics of what we can do with this public data. Um, and I wanted to um, engage with the question that James posed putting the panel together, which is how do we connect without exposing people? So thinking it through, I found um, a paper by uh, Segura, Wiles and Pope, I think it is, uh, 2017 in, research, in the journal Research Ethics, incredibly helpful for thinking about an overview of how the internet and web-based technologies are increasingly challenging our existing frameworks for ethics and research. Um, so, like I said, my department is highly interdisciplinary and our ethics committee checklist uh, 
runs to more than a page when you uh, are asked which disciplinary standards you're um, held to and which you've read and conformed with um, when you're preparing your application. And I think in the in these increasingly interdisciplinary research contexts, um, this menu of options can be more confusing than and constraining than reassuring. So Segura and colleagues are really helpful in thinking through how you navigate that menu of choices when you're trying to create um, a robust ethics framework for your project. Um, and they are really alert to a problem that, um, that I face, which is all, all kinds of digital data are now easily accessible, but ethical guidelines are increasingly inconsistent about how researchers should use them. The web in particular poses new challenges that compel researchers to reconsider concerns of consent, privacy and anonymity. So they say web data, um, including cont content from, for example, community websites, forums, uh, individuals' websites, blogs, social network sites uh, like Facebook, and microblogging uh, services such as Twitter, these forms of data are not produced for research, um, and so they're distinct from online data sources like surveys or interviews where existing frameworks can be applied. So how, how do we shift our <coughs> framework to include those? So I guess my comment and concern is that just because these data are available um, and posted in public spaces doesn't mean we should access them and use them. So this was really brought home to me um, uh, when we started the, every, the work we did on the Everyday Sexism uh, project. So it came before Me Too, but it's very much in the same line. Um, it was the brainchild of Laura Bates, who um, in 2012, after what she refers to as a, bad, a really bad week, <laughs> when she was subject to so many instances of everyday sexism, she started to catalogue them. Um, she set up this website to invite um, other women, but not just women, to post their experiences, both as a sort of show of solidarity, but also um, as a way of surfacing the relentlessness of these experiences. Um, so often dismissed Bates felt that recording these experiences would help to amplify them and draw attention to the seriousness of the problem. In 2017, when we started the project, there were more than 120,000 <coughs> entries of varying sizes. So some of the entries were tweeted in, some of them were entered into this um, the platform right here. Um, so those could get very, very long. There's, a, in, some, in many cases, a lot of text to be dealing with. The project came about in a really opportune way. Um, so um, Laura Bates was in the University of Oxford being honoured for her work on uh, using the internet for the public good. And we <coughs> brainstormed some ideas about how we might be able to interact with the project data. Um, I believe she's turned down the approaches by other researchers, so we were really conscious of how lucky we were to be able to work on the project. And without her cooperation, I think we would have been in very murky ethical waters. <coughs> so I think par partnership is, is a great way forward when you're not quite sure of the sort of boundaries of your research in terms of like <coughs> So sitting down with Laura Bates at the beginning of the project allowed us to discuss our project methodology and some concerns that she had about the use of the data. So essentially what we wanted to do was to apply some critical methods to it, particularly topic modelling, um, to sort of sift. It was, it was both a sort of methodological uh, experiment, so can, can you apply complicated methods to try and surface themes in a big data set like this? Um, and also uh, sort of... A, a, a comp you know, a, a, an exercise in trying to see what the computer would think of as themes and whether we could um, sensibly come to any conclusions from what, what was there um, and give us some sort of more insight into the project entries. Um, and I think Laura Bates was really concerned that we wouldn't do anything too reductive, you know, some, or something that would create um, a higher of <laughs> harm or um, experiences of harm. Um, when we first started, we uh, called the project a semantic map. She was very um, nervous about this idea of a map, for example, of different types of sexism around the world. Um, so we had to really go backwards and forwards a lot, a lot to figure out what would be a sensible way forward and what would give us some really interesting data, but what she felt would be um, in line with the project's uh, aims and wouldn't be a sort of betrayal of anyone who'd contributed to the site. And those conversations, I think, were essential to help us feel like we were in the right ethical space. 
So I, I think working with the Living Project um, <coughs> is really helpful. And um, when I was thinking about how historians might be using digital archives, I came across another paper in Research Ethics by a historian called um, Holly Crossan White, talking about how researchers who use digital archives to explore particular periods for really sensitive topics in history should apply the same care to those personal stories they find as they would to data from living participants. So I guess my um, uh, my proposition is actually working with living participants and working with a living project really helps you to hone in on those questions. Um, so I think she's absolutely right. Uh, so I'm really upset with my slides now. <laughs> so essentially what we did was um, we were looking for word frequency and um, co-occurrence of um, words in particular topics. I'm sure most of you are really familiar with topic modelling. I wasn't at all. I'm not a particularly um, data savvy <coughs> uh, researcher, but I work with lots of people who are. And I'm really lucky in that way. So my colleague who's a physicist talked me through topic modelling, which is essentially taking the words, stemming them to, so that the computer can make sense of them, and then allowing it to go through and to peel out topics. So looking for um, lots of words that frequently occur together and then creating little what they call bags of words that are um, then defining themselves as a topic. So we wanted to know what those topics were and what the relationships were between them. So what we ended up with was something like this. So these are the project entries on this side. Um, these are the sort of the topics that we were given. And these are the sorts of uh, words that, that appeared in bags of words. And what we tried to do was then to go through qualitatively and make sense of them. So to try and figure out what are the, what are the words that are creating a lot of meaning in these bags. Um, so you can see um, these are the sort of <coughs> indicators that we might use to figure out what's going on in the bags of words. So we came up with um, a range of topics. Interestingly, um, from, so we uh, applied the, um, you can fine tune topic modeling so that you can ask it to look for as many topics as, it, as, as uh, the computer can come up with, in which case you get lots of nonsensical bags of words. And then you can refine it down and go for smaller and smaller numbers uh, of um, topics. And then you start to get sense making. And it's an interesting experiment to work through different um, numbers of topics to see what you get. So we initially looked for um, seven and then we widened it out to I think just over 20. And we got some really interesting uh, nuances when we widened out to 20 topics. Um, um, yeah, I'm gonna keep going because otherwise we'll run out of time. So the other thing we were interested in was <coughs> relations between topics. So the, of the initial seven topics, six of them were topics that had, um, as Laura Bates had been going through the entries and talking about the project and lobbying um, uh, and creating some sort of platform for talking about sexism. Uh, six of those topics were topics that she had talked about a lot. And in her book, they sort of become the, um, the meaning, uh, meaningful sort of chapters. Um, and then the topic zero we call media or online and it's something that comes up in every topic so all the topics were related in some way so the thickness of the lines are the strength of the ties so you can see that they're all related there um, and zero was a really interesting topic because it just it seemed so so strongly related to a number of our um of our topics there were really thick lines between it so there were, but just going back to the qualitative methodology, what it allowed us to do was to say, here's something that's really um, strongly connecting some topics together. And, and often you get stories like, um, uh, this thing happened to me and then I tweeted about it. And um, you know the reaction was basically really negative and it really reinforced the experience of the thing that happened. So um, I guess we, we learned a lot from doing the project and the methodology was kind of helpful because what it allowed us to do is really treat uh, the data in a way that didn't draw attention to individual project entries it didn't draw attention to individual contributors it allowed us to look at the data in a sort of in, i guess a macroscopic way to pinch that um that idea from Tim Hitchcock. you know so and in, in a way that dealt with some of the issues around um identifying information 
So, um, moving on to the new project, um, uh, very quickly, um, these issues are really coming back to, um, uh, to give me a kick up the behind um, for my new project, which is a partnership, again, project with um, English Heritage this time, looking at whether we can use social data to um, understand more about how people engage with heritage sites. Um, so it brings uh, related challenges and new challenges, I think. Um, so, you know, part of the um, project is really to reflect on moments of connection between histories and custodians and um, audiences. Uh, but of course, you know, it's very difficult to analyse this kind of data without giving too much away. For example, these lovely images are from Instagram, from, uh, from users. And put like that, you can't see any identifying information really, but that's obviously someone's child. Um, so I think, you know, thinking about what people put into the public sphere and how much they know about what that, uh, how that data will live beyond the moment at which they post it. Um, as a researcher, that's, that's I, I think that's a really difficult call to make, how much you would then reveal about the information that people are putting out there. And it's one that I'm still trying to um, grapple with. So, um, I know that the uh, Association of Internet Researchers, for example, um, just you know recommends a very sort of reflexive approach and just simply uh, encourages you to, to think in a very agile way, as I was discussing at the beginning, about um, what's permissible. And there are lots of researchers um, writing and publishing about what you know different kinds of publics and how public a public environment is. So social media is seen as qualitatively different from um, a research forum, for example, where you might talk about very private topics and where the community is much more bounded. But, you know, a lot of this social media content is tweeted to family members and to personal networks. And we're sort of deliberately interested, really, in those um, posts that don't tag um, English Heritage, because we're interested not in the kind of dialogue between the audience and English Heritage, but how people are talking about histories and narratives and experiences. <coughs> Uh, in, a, in a much more, uh, in a much less formal way. So you can see I've got some sort of clumsy ways of dealing with this at the moment, just sort of blocking out um, handles and um, profile pictures so that I can show, you know, the sorts of things that we're interested in. So, you know, what time of uh, the day do people visit places? Are they looking for a particular kind of atmosphere? Does that connect to something that's happened there? Um, here's a lovely you know, deck of um, tweets from Porchester Castle celebrating particular moments in its history. And these are the sorts of things I'm really interested in. How do people connect to these stories? What is it that they're depicting? And how are they, you know, what's the context in which they're sharing that information? But, you know, it's, I, I recognise how clumsy it is to take these little bits of information out. And I'm still grappling, I guess, with how to, how to aggregate that data in the same way that we did with the everyday sexism data in order to make it uh, feel less personal, more meaningful, um, but still representative somehow. So uh, just so, yeah, these are the sorts of things we're interested in, the wonderful, the wonderful content, but not straightforward thinking about how to report it. So I guess finally, um, these are my thoughts for the panel and it's a little bit um, messy but I guess a lot of my thinking around this is a bit messy at the moment so it's a moving target I don't think there are any easy answers even when you're going to a very formal document like a uh, checklist for your research ethics committee there are so many different uh, things to take into account not even that is a straightforward thing to do so reviewing approaches from different disciplines has really helped just thinking um, Again, through the lens of history, um, when I was preparing my thoughts for this um, presentation, it, it's really helped me think about where this data, uh, how this data might be used in the future and how that could help me think about how I might use it now. You know, what are my responsibilities as a researcher in a um, department of, uh, in the Faculty of Social Sciences? How would that change if I were sitting as a historian 80 years in the future and looking back at this stuff? I guess um, something that we rely on is working with our ethics committees in dialogue. So not thinking about it as a sort of benchmark to have reached and then pass through and, you know, here we go, we can, you know, roll out the project, but, you know, something something to check back in with. And I think the great thing about 
working with partners is that that also enables you to have another lens through which to review your own thinking about what's okay and thinking about different audiences. Um, and I guess, yeah, my further reflection was, you know, I guess we're laying the future uh, historians' uh, foundations out here, you know, thinking about how we use this data now will be helpful in steering historians in 10, 20, 50, 80, 100 years' time uh, in thinking about how to use social data. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So today I'm going to briefly tell you about the so-called legislated, voluntary and what I'm calling eco-ethics questions that I've encountered in the past years while doing digital history research and oral history research on digital history stroke digital humanities. So first a little context, um, for the past few years I've been at work on recovering oral histories of digital humanities. I've interviewed about 40 well-known and lesser known individuals. The first book on the project um, that I uh, published with Andrew Flynn is called Computation of the Humanities Towards an Oral History of Digital Humanities and that came out in 2016. And for about the past three years, I've been at work on a new book about the so-called hidden contributions that were made to Father Roberto Busa's renowned Index Themisticus project by the mostly female key punch operators who worked on the project during the period around 1956 to 1967. And contributions like theirs have mostly been overlooked by the canonical history of digital humanities with its emphasis on technological progress and narratives of the great man uh, like Musa. So during the course of the research I've encountered various ethical issues and as I said I'm going to for the purposes of trying to sort of scratch the surface of them um, today I'm going to divide them into these three categories. Um, I've taken the terms legislated and voluntary ethics from an article by Mary Lor uh, Larson She's defined legislated ethics as what one can do and voluntary as what one will do. So one ethical issue that I've encountered during my research that surely falls into the area of legislated ethics can be summarised by the question, who owns the oral history interviews that the interviewees and I have recorded? So in many oral history um, projects, it has been standard practice to ask interviewees and interviewers to transfer their copyright to the institution or repository that will store and possibly disseminate the recording. I was deeply uncomfortable with asking for copyright to be transferred. Um, I think due to the power dynamics that I felt that this could open up, especially when I was positioning the work as um, you know, trying to work with you know, untold stories and hidden stories and so on, then the idea of saying, you know, thank you very much and can you now sign over your, your rights on this seemed, um, I, I was very uncomfortable about it and I, I must say that at, at a very early stage of the project, um, an individual whom I had hoped to interview really, really pushed back strongly against um, the request. And so I, I sort of felt, you know, I felt um, galvanised then to draw the work of Doherty and Simpson and to follow their model of leaving the copyright with the interviewees and instead asking them to agree that their interviews could be made accessible via Creative Commons, license, Commons licenses. Um, and I was also lucky enough to receive funding from UCL, which allowed me to publish the corresponding book, uh, Open Access. So far, so good. Um, but what has been far thornier for me is in and the context of Larson's idea of voluntary ethics or what one uh, will do that can arise, <coughs> for example, when you, you know, when somebody signed that um, Creative Commons license and now you're going to take the transcript and you're going to make it freely available online. So 
imagine the scenario where the interview the interviewee has agreed that they make their oral history interview freely available um but i wonder about in what sense do i still have a duty of care to them and to their words and um, so if we take the scenario whereby the interviewer um feels quite comfortable with what they're making available but i for example have some reservations um, in what ways can and should my decisions about what to release be influenced by the relationship that I have with the interviewees and also with my understanding of the wider purpose of my research. Uh, in the paper on ethical concerns about using digital archives for doing research on so-called forgotten individuals, Holly Crossan White, who Catherine you've already cited, um, she cites the work of Richardson and Godfrey and they've suggested that an in, that a, a sort of the benefit of this interview form is that a relationship develops between the interviewee and the interviewee and that this can strengthen an interviewer's duty and obligation to act with sensitivity and to proceed responsibly um, but in some ways i guess i worry about the flip side of this and of the limits of it and when might actually a feeling of duty and obligation <coughs> spill over into uh, being too involved or behaving in an overbearing way um, if we think about uh, the historians 80 years in the future um, at what point might, it, might I make you know decisions that actually you know within the larger scheme of things maybe I was earning too much on the side of, of caution for example so for me this also intersects with the fact that in my personal case I'm an insider of the community that I seek to study so my PhD was history and digital humanities so this can not only shape the power dynamic of the interview but it can of course then come into play when I'm, I'm editing transcripts and reflecting on the potential implications of the comments that interviewees have made so far I've proceeded um, entirely in line with what interviewees um, asked for and stated and also with um, the approach of the digital panopticon project which states if you engage in historical research you must be prepared for whatever information you may encounter the digital panopticon does not hide any information so in the case of the research i've been doing i don't see this changing but i think that one must still be power one must still be mindful of how power dynamics and questions of identity can then converge on these questions of voluntary ethics. Um, for my final point, I want to move to another uh, type of ethics that has occurred, maybe not do so as a result of the research, I would say, and I'm provisionally referring to this as eth uh, echo ethics, and I'm, I'm sure one of you will be able to tell me um, a better term for it, a more formal term. So, as I said, I've been working on a book about the female key punch operators who worked in Gallerate in Milan on Vusa's Index the Mysticus project. So, though their work was overlooked and uh, devalued by Vusa and indeed by many later scholars, they did make an immense contribution to the research on the Index the Mysticus, which is often described as one of the first digital humanities projects. And they transcribed onto punched cards some 12 million words in nine different languages in Latin, Hebrew, Greek and Cyrillic alphabets. And they worked with Busa until about 1967, when, as he described it, I completed the punching of all my texts. <laughs> so given what is known about the Western cultural and social realities of many women's employment as clerical workers in the office, their treatment in statistical computing bureaus and the burgeoning computer industry and so on, we might not find it particularly surprising that the work of the key punch operators uh, was devalued and overlooked in the way that it was. Uh, moreover, and I think it's very important for me to state this explicitly, I'm not proposing that the work of the operators was somehow scholarly or technologically innovative. Actually, I argue that it would be totally inappropriate to attempt to filter the cont their contributions through patriarchal criteria of esteem like innovation and invention that had in fact been implicitly called on in the devaluing of their work. The oral is history interviews with the operators that I carried out together with my colleague uh, Marco Passerotti 
The descriptions that they give in those interviews show that they did work that was more varied and probably, um, I, I think we could say, more sophisticated than what might be inferred from the designation of clerks that was usually used to describe their roles. But there's no doubt that during the interviews, they mainly um, recalled that their jobs were about punching the text of the Index Domesticus and related authors and verifying the materials. So as I said, it probably cannot, their work probably can't be described as seminal or innovative. And this is really a crucial point. Uh, the training that they received uh, from Busa in the training school that he set up and the conditions that they worked under were characterized for the most part by a lack of autonomy, a lack of possibilities for progression, and they would have been precluded from making what we might think of as technologically innovative contributions. So you might be wondering why on earth should their contributions be recovered then? So my attempt to answer this has been framed by the analytical frameworks of fields like feminist technology studies and the sociology of science and areas like gender and expertise. And in line with this scholarship and especially the work of uh, Mar Hicks, for example, I want to reveal the importance of the everyday nature of their contributions for what they were, quotidian but absolutely essential to the project. The operators um, made contributions um, without which it would have been impossible for the project to have taken place. The significance of everyday computing labour has been elegantly um, uh, discussed by Hicks when she wrote, and I quote, the labour of everyday, everyday people whose work made, computing, made computer deployment possible and determined what computers could do has received little attention. As important as hardware may be, computing functioned due to vast arrays of human workers expressed through workflow organisation, operator actions and software. Networks of labour and expertise extended into the systems themselves, constructing the social and technological bedrock on which all computing projects rest." End of quote. So in addition to this, in addition to wanting to you know, appreciate the quotidian rather than demean it, um, I argue that Busa was not a passive recipient of those, of those dynamics that arguably would have framed the work of the key punch operators as being unskilled in any case. So in one of the few sustained, uh, and this is a picture of them at work when they were in, in the lab in Galarate, um, in one of the um, few sustained uh, discussions that we have from Busa when he discussed their work, he seems to me to go out of his way um, to emphasise that it was uh, unscholarly, that it was troublesome to him, and that uh, their work was really in need of constant correction. And my argument is that in the references that he made to the key punch operators, either in the references or in the silences, that, it, that I think what we're seeing is him working out um, I guess who was scholarly, who was technical, and what it could mean to be a so-called lone scholar, to meet this ideal of the lone scholar, who nevertheless had a large co-team of workers. Um, so he had up to 60 people working with him, not only key punch operators. And so I believe that the treatment and the portrayal of the key punch operators um, of the Index Themisticus <coughs> helped to determine whose voice could be heard and whose voice would be silenced as digital uh, humanities or its forerunner humanities computing came into being. So for me, the idea of eth e echo ethics has been raised as I move from doing this research on 1950s humanities computing or digital humanities to using then all manner of technical tools and infrastructures and archives in connection with my daily research and teaching. I ask myself to what extent those asymmetrical power relationships and those iniquities and the way that they characterise the conditions under which the Index Themisticus came into <coughs> being, to what extent do they echo through the, the present day digital tools and labour organisations and infrastructures that we now use that are in some way, maybe not directly, but that are in some way um, connected to those earlier contexts and to those earlier um, uh, social bedrocks. Uh, I think was uh, Mar Hicks' uh, uh, term that I quoted earlier. So as Jacqueline Vernemont has argued, while digital archives are envisaged as the answer to women's exclusion from the power relations that constituted literary archives, 
we have yet to parse the relationships between gender and the tools central to digital archives, and that this can probably be in writ large. Um, so in line with the growing wealth of scholarship uh, that is uh, offering an emerging cultural critique of uh, the digital humanities and beyond, um, I remain fascinated to understand the implications of these so-called echo ethics and what they might give rise to for digital history now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right, shall I move over here? Yeah. Yeah. Just can you see if you can rub your fingers on the camera? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether it's our fingers because you've got smudged. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. No, it's just out of focus. Okay. No, I just had to tap. Right, so uh, evening everyone. I've, um, my name's Kelly. Um, I rather liked the description of those um, uh, key punch operators as unscholarly and troublesome because that's kind of how <laughs> I think about myself. Um, so, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, I rather cheekily call myself a public historian because most of the work that I do is um, uh, online and on road, as we call it in South London. So I'm here mostly to talk about my online activity, which is mostly done at night time with a gin and tonic. Um, uh, and also to reflect a little bit on my experiences as being a kind of um, archive digger of sorts in the various communities of people that are contributing to how people see the past online, whether that be on kind of formal structures like Wikipedia or, or, or blogs like Tumblr. Um, so this is the uh, on-road bit. So this is an exhibition I curated at, at Brixton Town Hall to mark the 70th anniversary of the Windrush, Empire Windrush arriving um, in the UK in 1948. Um, it was particularly looking at the very intimate relationship of Brixton to the Empire Windrush and also the work of a studio photographer called Harry Jacobs. Um, this is a artwork by Indradeka Akunili Crosby, who is a Nigerian American artist um, who was commissioned by Art on the Underground to do the first in a series of site specific murals on top of Brixton tube stations, those of you uh, that recognise it. Um, uh, Indradeka's work especially uses photo collage, and all of those, the background of that painting, are photographs drawn from. Um, uh, archive collections, um, found uh, photographs of the people of Brixton and uh, the environment in Brixton, which is uh, rapidly changing in the midst of gentrification. That's me and Hilary Beckles. <laughs> so Hilary Beckles is the, um, uh, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, as I should probably call him, is the uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of West Indies at Cave Hill, and he is also the Chair of the CARICOM um, <coughs> Reparations Commission. CARICOM is the Community of Nations in the Caribbean and uh, the Reparations Commission is um, uh, heading a campaign to charge European governments um, or to, to bring a case to European governments who are involved in uh, the transatlantic slave trade and Hilary Beckles, who's a historian, is at the forefront of that. So that's Brixton uh, Library, a public library locally to me. It's all Brixton and that is outside of Black Cultural Archives as well. How old is somebody in the rooms in that picture? You're not in that picture? Oh. <laughs> you can spot yourself in a minute. <laughs> um, uh, and this was a walking tour that I did specifically looking at black women's history in Brixton and the black women's movement. Now, when I um, was thinking earlier on today about 
throwing a picture up for you to look at. I wanted to, I wanted uh, something that kind of represented how I think about the work that I do online. This is an uh, illustration by a uh, French uh, traveller called Jean-Baptiste Libre. Um, uh, he went to Brazil and he did a, a, a book um, of his observations of Brazil and a number of those were uh, illustrations of um, African uh, enslaved African people in Brazil. And this one in French, I'll translate into English because my French is awful, is called The Naturalists Negroes. So this is a, a scene of uh, four, in five, six individuals who have been into the rainforest to collect um, the, uh, what would become the specimens of natural history in European museums. And it's their stories that I think that are so often absent from the way that we, um, the way that we see the past as it's portrayed online. And indeed the way that we see it as it's portrayed in the institutions as well. Um, this is, uh, some of you may recognise, is a photograph of uh, the Benning bronzes as they're, as they're displayed downstairs in the British Museum. Um, and this is an image of the Benning bronzes that we don't often see. This is a, a photograph that was taken when the palace uh, of the Abba of Benin was raided um, uh, by British military forces in 1897. This, is at, this picture is actually in a photo album at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, and again, you know, if you were to type Benin bronzes into Google to bring up um, a search and what the Benin bronzes look like, it will probably be those objects in the context of a, um, a European museum, not in the kind of violence and trauma uh, by which they were acquired. One of the things that I wanted to speak about today, and one of, what, one of the ways that I one of the ways that I think about um, a lot of the work that I do online, working on Wikipedia and the other Wikimedia projects, is this: is that I'm continuing a legacy of recovery. And that legacy of recovery, especially for people who are descended uh, from survivors of, of um, uh, African chattel slavery, is one that has been uh, generations deep. Um, so this is a photograph of the first Black History Month in 1987. In that picture are Ansel Wong, um, Linda Bellos and Akwaba um, Ali Sibo, who were, uh, were seen as a kind of some of the co-founders of Black History Month in the UK. And it was related to Black History Month, which is where I got my first introduction to the intention um, <coughs> of contributing to projects like Wikipedia. This is uh, just around the corner. Um, the, I went along to the first Black History Month Editathon, which is a workshop where people learn to contribute to Wikipedia. Uh, that was hosted by the Akuyama Centre. Uh, which was in UCL at the time, they uh, wrapped up last year. It was a research centre um, devoted to looking at the histories and geographies of um, black uh, Londoners um, uh, that uh, Caroline Bressy and Gemma Romain uh, did incredible work with. And they hosted this first Black History Month editathon that I went along to. And it would be a couple of years really before I touched uh, Wikipedia, because I, I had better things to do. And it wasn't until <laughs> Um, I went along to an exhibition called the No Colour Bar Exhibition and I saw the work of a, um, an artist uh, called Claudette Johnson who does these beautiful large scale portraits of women and I wanted to find out more about her work and um, <coughs> to my surprise I could find nothing online and what I could find was quite sporadic. So I set about writing one of my first complete articles or starting one anyway. Um, but it's in looking into kind of um, the relationship between encyclopedists and um, people of African descent recovering their history, um, uh, I began to sort of, it, I began, my eyes began to be opened as to how people of African descent had been recorded in reference volumes. This is the 1911 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That is the edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica that is um, most commonly um, available in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And this is the entry on uh, Negro. Um, I kind of highlighted a, a, a bit of the sense, a bit of the passage there, so you don't have to read the whole thing. The whole article is, is more or less a continuation of this very racist perceptions about African people. And when you think about what the, um, and I should also say that the 1910 uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, because it was the only, well, it was the main text and a, and a text that had ascended into the public domain at the beginnings of Wikipedia. This is what became the kind of, um, uh, the spine of Wikipedia. Um, so it's also worth mentioning that uh, W.B. Uh, du Bois um, 
uh, and uh, I think uh, Woodson um, uh, Carter as well both had encyclopedia projects. This is the um, this is the uh, committee for Du Bois's Encyclopedia Africana. Um, the reason, and then these are some examples of encyclopedia projects. There's um, BlackPass.org, Cultural Encyclopedia, and the uh, Ivo Archive are both West African based um, uh, online encyclopedias that people are trying to get going in order to represent their own languages and their own cultures. This is a kind of well used slide um, done by Mark Graham at the Oxford um, uh, Internet Institutes. Thank you. I'm wondering which way the book. The words went wrong. Um, but it's a, it's a great illustration of the kind of inequalities that are present on Wikipedia. So this is a representation of articles in Wikipedia and obviously there are more articles within that red circle than there are outside of it. Um, so um, I just want to talk very quickly about some of the stuff that I do uh, and, and as opposed to speaking about actual the, the text on Wikipedia, I want to talk about its sister project, Wikidata. So Wikidata is an open links database which um, runs alongside Wikipedia. It's uh, relatively young. Wikipedia, I think, celebrated its 18th birthday this year. Uh, Wikidata was five years old last year. Um, and um, one of the things that I've been trying to get off the ground, and this is one of the things that I wanted to speak about today was uh, in this kind of idea of ethics is the kind of um, precarity of a lot of this work and the the reliance on often independent or community uh, projects in order to do this work around the recovery. Um, uh, the UCL's uh, Legacies of British Slavery project has, has a kind of very well-known database project looking at the uh, slave ownership. Um, I think of that database there may be half a dozen people who were considered uh, enslaved at that time as kind of uh, uh, on, on the person database of the uh, legacies of British slavery. One of them is Robert Wedderburn's mum, uh, Rosanna. So Robert, Robert Wedderburn was a Jamaican <coughs> born um, preacher, uh, firebrand and uh, abolitionist. Um, and um, his mother, as an entry in Wikidata, um, and because I, uh, so there, there's his mother there, an enslaved woman who we know only by, by her first name. Um, because I was able to um, create a Wikidata item for her, um, now she's able to be represented on Wikipedia. And oh, not on Wikipedia, even on Google, on, in a Google knowledge search. So hopefully bringing some visibility to people who would otherwise have been invisible. Let's see if I've done this. This is a quick, um, what is this? <laughs> a quick query that I've done using Wikidata. So Wikidata, um, until a couple of years ago, if you were enslaved, it listed slave as your occupation. And one of the things that uh, the Wikidata community did is that we pushed for um, slavery or to, to be enslaved to be a social classification. So there are many different ways of, of, of uh, social classification being called. So this is an example, sorry, I'm going to have to click on it. This is an example of a query. So one of the things that allows you to do this, so this is all enslaved people, not just people who are enslaved through um, African chattel slavery. Um, one of the things it allows you to do in kind of a project that I'm trying to get off the ground is to uh, um, log the start of people's enslavement, where that is recorded, and also the end of it, where it's recorded as well. So it could end through um, manumission, it could end uh, through emancipation, it could end through self-purchase or self-liberation as well. So these are all things that people, like me, need to, um, need to uh, populate. Um, right, now I've got to get back to the thing. Next 
Um, as I mentioned, and I think one of the things that uh, I wanted, wanted to talk about today was where the labour for this work comes from. Um, Wikimedia has uh, coined, or it's in 2007, coined this term knowledge equity. Um, and this is the, or, or two twin terms really that work together that forms the vision or the strategy for the next, um, for the next 15 years. And that is knowledge as service and knowledge equity. Knowledge equity is about uh, building equity into the, the, no, um, the knowledge and communities of people who have been marginalised um, out of the structures of power and privilege. Um, however, Wikipedia and Wikimedia are projects that rely on voluntary labour. And often, and that means that any um, inequalities with regards to who can do that work is reflected on the encyclopedia. Um, earlier, or last year, uh, Martin Dittus, who is another researcher at the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, wrote a, uh, a piece for Wired.com, uh, which uh, very handily, it was called, To Reduce Inequality, Wikipedia Should Consider Paying Editors. That's a rather controversial thing to say um, in the open knowledge movement, but really to, um, to reduce the precarity, not only of um, editors like myself who are doing this work, but also thinking about a lot of the work that's being done with independent archives and community archives who are out there doing the oral history work, getting HLF funded projects, but have very little access to um, core funding in order to continue to do the work. Um, addressing these issues around um, labour and pay is essential. And then finally, um, I just want to um, draw on really what the potentials of a lot of this work are. Um, uh, we just had a quick look, a very poor example of a, a query on Wikidata. And what Wikidata also gives the possibility to do is, is to build in multi vocality into a, a, an into database. And this is something that I don't often see replicated, especially in um, database projects com coming out of academia. Um, it's especially important when uh, I think working with communities who have their own uh, traditions of uh, knowledge um, that can be represented alongside or even at the forefront as the authority as opposed to um, uh, academia. Um, right, so that is um, uh, hopefully a look at my attempts to kind of, to kind of try and um, infiltrate the infrastructure of the internet and the work as done by uh, unscholarly and troublesome people at <laughs> night, um, that really have a, a, a fundamental effect as to what, whose histories are represented online. Um, and how they are represented as well. Hello. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Sean Webb. I work at the University of Sussex, a colleague of James. And um, so, I was originally going to talk about one project, but now I'm going to talk about two projects. Um, because I thought that actually doing a comparison uh, between the two would be more helpful in thinking about um, kind of ethics in terms of digital archives and preservation. Um, so I'll briefly describe the two projects that I, that I, um, I want to um, compare and then we'll look at maybe the kind of ethical differ differences, the ethical overlaps, and then think about rights and responsibilities of, I'm using GDDR um, uh, terminology here, um, the rights and responsibilities as a data controller to our data subjects. <coughs> um, 
And I also kind of want to think about this disciplinary boundaries. Um, is that an important point, but also see the way in how we might decipher perceived ethical responsibilities based on disciplinary approaches, um, which become moving targets. So in this case, it will be social science data, maybe versus um, historical data sources or evidence or material. Um, so the first project that I want to um, uh, describe or, or introduce you to is to identity representation and preservation of community digital archives and collections. A really long title, I call it Preserving Digital Archives, or Preserving Community Archives. Um, so this is a British Academy Rising Star Engagement Award. Um, and this is based on the idea that uh, community archives, um, which um, um, represent marginalised groups, um, are um, uh, precarious. Um, they use digital technology to ensure representation, but that digital archives that they use um, are in danger of being lost because of um, uh, the fragility of the digital infrastructures that they rely on and the human infrastructures that they, they rely on. So this project is, is about kind of creating a dialogue between community archives, between uh, digital preservation communities and, and seeing, you know, kind of how we can support community archives in their endeavours without taking away their autonomy. Um, so, this, so this is for me is, is, is kind of based on my background in digital humanities but also in digital preservation uh, work that I've been doing with um, the Queer in Brighton archive in Brighton um, and on kind of historical ideas of social networks and association of culture. Um, and the second project then is this project called Reanimating Data. And so this project then, um, it's described as a collaboration between academics, archivists and activists interested in young women's sexual health and empowerment. And this is based on um, uh, a data set um, of um, interviews collected as part of a social research study conducted in Manchester in 1989 to 1990. Um, and it's uh, the, the data set is the Women Risk and AIDS project. So um, WAP is the, is the project. So this project is about kind of getting those that data set that was created in the late 90s and see how we might reanimate that material. So looking at ways that we can re-explore or explore or reuse that content. So there's a 30 year gap between when that data was created. So I wanted to kind of compare these two because um, they're kind of similar in some ways and very different in other ways. <coughs> Um, and I wanted to think about kind of the, the ethical approaches or considerations with these two projects. So there's two different projects with two different types of data sets. Um, so the Queer and Brighton um, uh, project, um, which is the basis for some of the uh, community archives and preservation work that I'm doing, um, is oral histories carried out in 2002 to 2014. Um, there's 60 plus interviews. Some are transcribed, some are just audio, um, some are edited transcripts, um, and there's complex, sometimes incomplete consent forms. Um, so kind of a body of work that's involved in going through those um, oral histories and kind of matching consent forms and looking at, um, you know, if there's a question mark over some of that consent. Um, so the second project then, the RAC project, was, which is uh, based on the reanimating re data project, as I said, it's a social research study, interviews carried out in, uh, nearly 30 uh, years ago. There's 50 plus interviews, and there's some audio, it's mostly transcriptions, um, and there was a lot of work um, that had to uh, go on in the background of migrating from old platforms. So there was actually a risk that that data could not be used. Um, so, and there's no consent forms for this data. Um, and I suppose I have a question of like, which is the historical data set? So the social scientific data that was carried out, or you know, the, the research that was carried out in the late, 19, uh, the late 1980s, in a sense becomes a historical data set now. And I think working with um, reanimating um, uh, project team, which includes Rachel from uh, the Sussex Humanities Lab, Rachel was approaching it from a very kind of, well, this is social science data, and I'm actually, well, it's actually historical data now. You know? So kind of thinking about, you know, the how these things and you mentioned moving targets so if this becomes a moving target um, and then thinking about both have problems and issues in terms of archiving access and being online so kind of the thing that i want to talk about is this idea of responsibilities of data controller and rights as, as data subjects 
Um, and within that, I wanted to think about well, the communities that we have those rights and responsibilities to. Um, and in many ways, in both data sets, these communities or the, the, the data subjects consist of living data subjects. Um, and that responsibility to people who might not be identified because in the reanimating data set particularly um, it's often only anonymized data that we work with. And thinking through this kind of constant renegotiation that goes on with the queer environment and re with the reanimating data. So I put in kind of thinking about well what are our communities within this. So in, in terms of the reanimating data set um, we're thinking about a community that is also the original research team. So their rights and responsibilities in terms of the people that they originally interviewed, their rights and responsibilities in terms of them as researchers um, and what they know about that data set. So Rachel has a very in-depth knowledge of some of the interviews that were carried out. Does she bring that through then in terms of sharing that information? So that kind of being aware of your own um involvement in that and i think you, what you were saying as well is that we become too close to it so kind of being aware of those um those maybe uh conflicts um yeah so i think in terms of the original uh, research committee uh, community as well for the reanimating data set i think i've got to that one instead um what i also kind of want to think about was that ethical stance of researchers and that difference between what we think about in terms of legislation and in terms of maybe we could see it as an ethical stance of researchers where it's trumped by the law of the land. And what I was thinking about in that um, context was the Belfast project, the oral history project, um, that many of you know was the, the Boston College um, oral histories that were subpoenaed by um, UK legislation, which contained Irish Republican and Lawless parliamentary um, interviews. Um, so again, thinking of rights and responsibilities of the original research community, what, what they can guarantee to the data subjects as opposed to what legislation will make them do. Um, okay. So with the uh, Queer and Brighton archive, which is the basis for the preservation or the preserving um, community archives, I was thinking about the constant renegotiation between the oral histories that we have and the consent forms that we have and some of the other documentation. So the original um, interviews are also have paperwork that's associated with them. So specifically there's consent forms which are sometimes accompanied by what I call a profile sheet and that includes questions around back, um, ethical background. And thinking again about GDPR, is this processing, is this processing exempt from or is it part of that exemption for archiving purposes? Are these profile sheets part of the archive collection or the project documentation? Should they be digitised and put in the digital archive? Um, should they be digitised, put in the digital archive and then embargoed? Um, and maybe not for, for, for use now, but for future use. Um, I'm thinking about that um, renegotiation as well, because the people and the individuals or the data subjects in the Queer and Brighton oral history collections are people that are still contactable. And actually there's sensitive issues there as well. In the Queer and Brighton archive, um, those oral histories, there's testimonies of people um, talking about their um, coming out experience, their transitioning experience, and even in some of the uh, uh, oral histories, there was um, a self-realization during the interview. So during the interview, it was some, the first time that someone stated openly that they were trans and hadn't done that before. Um, so thinking about a duty of care to protect privacy in these matters. So the ethical decisions or judgment calls, especially in terms of providing access, even when consent has been provided, the thing about doing the right thing. So for some of the oral histories in Queer and Brighton, you know, consent is clear. It's the, the sheet, which is very um, uh, comprehensive, the consent is clear. But uh, again, you were saying about kind of, well, do we have the responsibility as, you know, someone who is part of uh, going through or processing that archive to kind of think about the sensitivities that an individual might um, might experience. Um, and also, um, I was thinking about in the Queer and Brighton, so we have, um, so the original interviews, they were initially put online, but some uh, one individual asked for that access to be taken down. So, they, so the Queer and Brighton project took everything down then after the fact. And um, the current archiving process, which is basically done by, by me, um, 
and we're doing an exhibition. What are the ethical considerations in terms of ethical uh, of the exhibition as well? So this exhibition takes snippets from the oral history. Some of it is text, some of it is um, audio. Um, but thinking about the or orality, although this might increase the user experience, it also means that someone is identifiable. So if there's sensitive material in that, then again, it's about um, that balance between being ethical and kind of you know thinking about um, the user's experience. Um, in terms of the reanimating data archive, then we have a key concern about the originality with the social uh, science data. And um, they were thinking about the provenance of that, about authenticating the accounts of the anonymous transcripts. So initially they wanted to go back to the original contributors and it became quickly very obvious that this was A, a lot of work and B, there was an ethical responsibility on the original data subjects. So people might not want to be contacted again. They may not want to relive this part of their life. They, may, they might have found this a traumatic experience. And would we then go back and ask them to think, well, how have you been doing since then? Is that some sort of judgment that, you know, it, I don't think it, it's, it, was an, it would be an ethical thing to, to, to do. So we quickly, well, we won't do that. Um, and I'll quickly move on because James already waved at me. So uh, <laughs> I was also thinking about the kind of responsibility to the source. The actual responsibility to the digital object to the actual material and this is kind of in terms of thinking about ethics of access versus ethical or the ethical ideal of quality of representation historical record so are these the same so thinking about community protocols and thinking about maybe access not now but in the future so we have a responsibility to say that object that oral history and um, interview in the audio the transcript whatever it is but maybe now is not the time to have it um, published but we save that for future use. Um, and that's really important because, um, and this was, I think, the basis of some of the conversations that we had at um, um, an event last June, was the Digital Preservation Coalition's um, big list um, of digital species where community archives and community generated digital content is a critically endangered digital species. So when we think about the work that goes on with community archives that we're inviting and some of the things that um, Kelly is involved with as well, is this about creating representation for minority voices in the historical record. But if we're not um, careful and cognizant, that record will not be there because of the fragility of the historical record. Right, the wrong button. Um, and again, thinking about, we're recommissioning data that was perhaps decommissioned. And, you know, is that something to consider? Um, Lawrence Hill from the Brighton Digital Festival, you know, we had um, part of the um, Brighton Digital Festival conference last year was thinking about the right to be forgotten versus the right to be remembered. Um, I think that's a really uh, important consideration. There is a, a description of what critically endangered means, um, but this is an example of what those critically endangered community archives and community generated content consists of. It consists of data of marginalised or sub uh, cultural groups. It consists of one-off projects in our heritage. It consists of um, oral histories of the ME um, or uh, uh, groups. It consists of all these things that community archives and community organisations are carrying out in order to make sure that they're represented and heard. Um, very quickly, I want to think about kind of ethics of users as well. And um, so ways of listening and ways of describing things. So when we carried out two different events related to, the, to these to these different projects. One was listening to oral histories, one was reading the transcripts. And it quickly emerged that without context, people obviously were, it's an unconscious bias that people were listening to something and well, that must be a white middle class woman that's talking. And actually, you know, it was a trans woman who, you know, thinking about kind of like, what, what is it that people immediately think of? And um, in reading the anonymized text, what people started to do was they tried to classify the person. So where, where do they fit in, in terms of kind of social classes? Where do they fit? And again, thinking about kind of what are our uh, responsibilities in terms of describing that data. And I also think in ways of, uh, thinking about ways of archiving. So we capture emotion, maybe we can capture reaction, you know, why did together, why did metadata as community members? And thinking about judgment within that and maybe human error as part of that as well. And um, lastly, but not really, because I'm over of time. I wanted to leave you with, 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 with this kind of image of the digital archive, the Queer and Brighton digital archive. And I keep going back to this, but um, I usually say, you know, it's the two boxes here, which is full of documents and photographs, which will last longest. And the, the top 
uh, box is the hard drive, which contains the oral histories. And that's the most fragile part of that collection. But what I wanted to point out again is I've, I've used this on many slides, <coughs> and I've used this on Twitter, on thinking about due diligence and sharing and providing access to things. So this is part of the original collection, which one of the project um, leaders, you know, they kind of organised. And they put the number of their address on that box. So when I was tweeting that picture, I was like, no, oh, I better <laughs> remove that information. Because often it's, a, it's the little detail that we don't maybe pick up on immediately that will be, you know, will cause the most harm. And I think in terms of all this, you know, I'm, I'm led less by GDPR uh, legislation, although, you know, of course I am. And more about kind of, um, you know, reducing harm to the data subjects and data subjects. It's the individuals that you work with. Um, so I'll leave it there. Okay, um, we thank you to our speakers for giving us plenty of time to discuss. Um, before we launch into questions, I just want to kind of some themes, right? Um, so some themes that emerge for me, some things like uh, the value of doing some contemporary history or work with people that you know to make you think about ethics seems to come across really strongly. Um, I think digital history is a site of thinking about ethics within historical search more broadly, I think came across there, and obviously partnered with our colleagues who work in oral histories, but it mm -hmm. seems like we're kind of carrying on a flame from our colleagues in oral histories who've been banging on for a while, we should care about these things. <laughs> um, something about the agency of researchers in making choices and judgments um, that are kind of sometimes more cautious than the legal duty, seem to come up um, more than once. Um, things around renegotiation, things about what kind of right wins on an ethical level as opposed to what kind of right wins on a legal level. Mm. And I did sort of note down something about universities kind of power grabbing any copyright you can get hold of and how we kind of work with that. Um, particularly in terms of community archive as well, I think. Um, something around legacy structures of organisation and behaviour in around archives and how they intersect with formal and informal structures, and that came up quite a bit from more than one of the talks. Um, there was something clearly there for me about um, surfacing, recovering, the hidden, the everyday, the traumatic, the labour, the context in and around um, the data that's created. And finally, something about the relationship between kind of canonical knowledges, particularly our Encyclopedia Britannica and that thing we have access to, and resistant knowledges and the ways that the digital, the digital I think, in particular, can reamplify the former and kind of forces the latter into kind of precarious spaces, fragile spaces, or lost spaces. Um, so there are some kind of themes that kind of emerge from me. Um, what I'm going to suggest is that um, we open up to uh, the audience. Can I, can I kind of, instruct is the wrong word, can I suggest that the questions kind of try to aim at the panel more broadly, as opposed to being just directed at one speaker? If you really have a question one speaker, that's fine, but if you try and open it up, that's great. I'm not going to ask all our panellists to respond to all the questions, but I'm hoping that all of them can be answered by at least one person. I'm sorry, at least two persons. So, hands. There was discussion on Twitter, thank you oh. all, that was fantastic, um, about Catherine's comment about um, Treating living, uh, treating the dead as if they were living in terms of care, and I think that um, Sharon's approach is sort of thinking about minimising <coughs> harm. Um, do we owe the same duty of care to people who are living as to people who are dead? Should we apply the high, very high standards that we hold for the living to the dead, or does that limit work? Um, and other kinds of harms that can be done to those people materially different. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think it really depends, doesn't it? So that um, article by Holly um, Cross and White is really, it's, it really nicely draws out the tensions around um, historical research when you're talking about periods that are so close to us that there are relatives who also might need to be taken into account. So I think that's a really important point to raise that, you know, when there isn't a hierarchy of harm, but there's certainly periods where we need to be more careful um, because we need to think about how those histories live on through family members. Um, I mean, I think my, my natural um, feeling with ethics is to try and be as conservative, you know, to obey your most conservative instincts. And so I think I, I would err on the side of caution um by which i mean i would try to treat 
um, the dead as though they were living in the same way that I was um, worrying about contributors to the Everyday Sexism Project, for example. Um, but there must be, a, I guess, uh, as historians, we must be, uh, there must be a point where we start to think, okay, so this is sufficiently far in the past that perhaps we could draw different lines around it. I don't know, I'm flip-flopping as I'm talking <laughs> because I'm thinking about projects about, you know, uh, domestic violence in the medieval period and thinking actually this is a very triggering topic to be thinking about and maybe we have a duty to talk about it in a way that also considers the harm of our, you know, harm in relation to our audience and contemporary discourse around things like domestic violence. I'll stop talking because I feel like I'm digging a hole. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think what you're saying is, is it, but it is once you start kind of picking away at it, it's mm. really difficult. I mean, I can think of a, a number of examples where, I mean, there was a there was a project in Ireland. They I think it was, they released census records from 1910. I think, I think the census records, I can't remember which it was, mm. but they released it online and very quickly they got people responding saying, that's my descendant mm. and can you take that down? So they had so many requests that they had to um, close down the site and remove access again. And they really thought that they were okay. They had done their due diligence. It, the data is 100 years old, but actually, you know, there were still people who felt that was harmful to their families. Mm. Um, Two examples, just to riff off that, both that are used kind of uh, by genealogical researchers. One of them was quite recently in Australia that I think some of you may have seen where they, uh, I can't remember exactly what region it was, um, but they uh, redacted uh, civil records of how people were racialized. That means that completely made invisible anybody mm. who, who wasn't uh, white. Um, uh, and again, there was this huge uproar um, about that, as you would expect. And and also uh, an example in the UK is the digitisation of the uh, uh, slave registers. So the slave registers were a series of um, like censuses that were done in the run up towards emancipation in the 1830s, which aimed to um, record all the people that were um, owned by and who owned them in order to compensate um, the slave owners when emancipation happened um, and that led to more or less a, a, a complete census of enslaved Africans. This was digitised by Ancestry.com um, I think maybe about oh, 15 years or so ago maybe a bit more um, with the view that that would only be a, a, a available to those who had a, a subscription to Ancestry.com uh, there was a quite sustained community campaign to make sure that those records were freely available. And even then, what was digitised, or what was transcribed, I should say, from the registers, um, was transcribed very poorly and transcribed in a way that really, it was difficult. The discoverability for uh, researchers using it was very difficult. So, um, even though it, 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 can, it can seem very far removed, um, looking at how um, archives of, of people who are dead are used. I think oftentimes academic researchers um, can lose sight as, of who the end user is mm -hmm. um, when things are put online and hopefully with uh, an open license so that they can be reused. It's ordinary everyday people who are using, uh, who are using those to recovery, whether it be um, uh, for kind of uh, family issues are kind of more broadly yeah. thinking about um, other marginalised histories. Can I go to Stella in just a sec? Um, before I do, um, if you want to kind of vaguely wave at me, I'll have you down this. Okay. Stella. Um, kind of related to this, it just made me think, so I, for those of you who don't know me, I work at the British Library and several years ago we held an event um, connected with the Bryce Room residents who've been in residence with an exhibition um, about um, John Franklin and the search for the North West Passage in like the 1840s. Mm. But a descendant of John Franklin turned up to the event um, and then uh, um, and, and then afterwards came and had a chat and had a chat with Rob Sherman, who was the Bryce Room residents. Now, fortunately, she was delighted with the kind of fictional narrative that Rob had written about, the real narrative, narrative in the exhibition, but I did have a moment of thinking, oh gosh, here's me thinking, this is an exhibition that's an, um, an event that's happened in the 1840s. I would never have imagined it, that, that someone, a descendant, 
would kind of make themselves known at an event, but they did, and, and it did kind of then make me aware that, like you say, um, things that can happen in what you think is, is, is way back enough for no one to feel that they've got a personal connection um, can, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, I don't know, from a special curatorial point of view, or kind of, if I do, did make me think, well, oh, actually, um, e e even something mm -hmm. as back as 1840 can still have resonances, let's say, whether it's from something from the 1980s or something from five years ago. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to kind of chuck that in. Gentlemen, yeah. I, I, I was sacked mm. by the Professor of Information Science at City University in 1976 because he argued that information science was neutral and value free. And I argued that it has an ethical dimension. And he was being paid at the time by Shell in Nigeria. And so it seemed to be then that people who are working in information science needed to understand something of the tools and principles that were being worked with. And given that we're 50 years later, I'm not sure how many people actually know how many of the archaeologies of these knowledges are still lurking inside the tools. Uh, I started to think of the hyphen society, because that seemed to me to be about the simplest tool that will trip you up every time you try and do something. But it's 50 years, nearly, since we founded Librarians for Social Change. And I think librarians have a different ethical task to deal with from other classes of objects in the digital universe. And I'd like to see uh, an organisation such as this one putting up something in a couple of years' time uh, to make an event out of the 50 years of Librarians for Social Change. But the social media, I think, does raise relatively new ethical issues. There was a woman who was sacked by a local authority in, uh, for being a lesbian. And it's a real problem because the archives have disappeared. And the trouble is, if she disappears from history, then nobody will ever know that history happened. But she might now not want to be identified as the person who was caught up in that. And so if you can't name her, and you can't name her employer, then how do you bring onto the front stage that the event ever happened? Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to be a continuing problem that we have to really work out how to deal with. Information science, anyone? <laughs> yeah. I would just say that obviously I agree in that, you know, to some extent the that the roots of it go so much deeper even than the digital turn. So I work with the British Museum on a project on Sloan, Hans Sloan's catalogues. And it's a, you know, just beginning to sort of, I've been beginning to grasp um, how much has been um, like excluded from those catalogues and not admitted. So, you know, the networks through which these um, objects came, the type of uh, knowledge that was um, upon <coughs> which the catalogues were built, which are then not represented in those catalogues. And so there seems to be, as you say, there's an archaeology of this and, and this layer upon layer of, um, yeah, of these decisions. Sure. I think, uh, actually, what I'd like to just do is share from as project manager of the Digital Panoptica, a uh, situation where we actually kind of negotiated a compromise between sort of access and sensitivities. And it was to do with the, this was the uh, Phantom and Survivors convicts data in Tasmania. And one of the projects, the, the, those two projects, had done a lot of work to, after so the convicts were, had finished their sentences, to trace what happened to them after that, their marriages, the, their fam the, the, then their children, their families, through to their deaths. And part of, then, so part of that, they had a lot of data on their children, on children that they had. And they were this, uh, this part of it was what they felt very, very sensitive about, because then we're getting into the 20th century to people who are within living memory. Mm -hmm. So what we actually, the, the negotiation we came up with was that we would simply, on the website, we would show a date and that there was a child, you know, in the convict timelines, 
We wouldn't say anything else about the child, not the name or the play, you know, mm. the place where it was born. So we actually kind of came up with a way that we can put, you, you know, data that people can you you know use on the website without giving away anything. That's that the, the, the owners of that data, the cancer survivors, they were uncomfortable with and they felt overly sensitive. Mm. I mean, so it's, it's that feeling that you can, you, you, you know, case by case, you can kind of work out how far you can go and what what, what can be done. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you might have to say, no, we can't do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's interesting with the, the, the risk, uh, the Women's Risk and AIDS project from the from 89 and 90. The thing with that is, like, as, as a social science um, project, it was anonymized. So anything that they published after was was anonymized. But it's in terms of taking that data now and digitizing it and putting it online and making it available. So we're going through those interviews again to see well what identifiable pieces of information are there and kind of doing maybe another tranche of anonymization on it. And for the Queer and Brighton thing, what I find quite interesting is that at every stage that we're doing another Okay, now we're going to digitise it. I'm, I'm creating a metadata record for it, and we're going to use um, Atom um, at Sussex. That will be closed until we review that as a as a community, queer and Brighton community. Say, so, okay, so this this is the oral history that you um, participated in 2012. Here's your consent form that you gave for that. Here's what we've done, and I can do that because I can be part of that renegotiation. Being part of the community, I can do that. And maybe I'm too close to it, but. I think it's it's that kind of I just keep thinking about this due diligence and kind of you know whether or not it's legislative or where it's like you're you're bound by your involvement in something and um, and, and, and also like with me with career in Brighton there's a level of trust that comes from me being part of a community mm -hmm. that maybe another researcher wouldn't have so Again, thinking about reanimating data, Rachel, as, as the original um, researcher who was now part of this reanimate project, for her, that's a kind of a level of trust that she has. In, it's like ex in, implicit or explicit in the work that she's doing because she has that relationship with the data. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of, I don't know, it's this kind of rela relationship between data that we work on or work, work, you know, working on or working with communities is very different. So I'm working with rather than on. I was just wondering, when you were talking about like the exhibition and not wanting to for people to be identified by their voices, did you do any work with actors for actors, actors to read out transcripts? And, and okay, that wouldn't be the authentic voice from an oral history, but I was just wondering whether, whether you had had used like, actors, a bit like having documentaries where they get an actor to yeah. mm -hmm. to read the transcript yeah. in, yeah. so, so the person can't be identified. Yeah. But definitely just, just time resources. Uh, <laughs> so it's logistics, but you did <laughs> yeah. consider that as a methodology yeah. for the exhibition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think especially when it comes to kind of voluntary organisations or, or community organisations doing this work, um, who may only be funded for an 18 month a year long project, um, and they're funded to deliver, you know, to deliver um, a piece of work, with these particular outputs. Um, as Sharon was saying, that, that these relationships and really these skills don't have time to be developed within those community organisations. And even how academia or how the heritage sector more broadly can think about how they support those organisations and support that work, I don't think really there has been um, all that much work done around that. And I think to have a robust ethical, equitable community that is made up of academia, of the heritage sector, as well as, as of voluntary and community organisations. There is still a long way to go in the, um, in the UK, um, which is, from my perspective, frustrating, because I think oftentimes the interesting stuff, not the interesting stuff, the impactful things happen after the project is finished. Yeah. Um, they happen 10 years down the line um, when, you know, when people involved at that first stage actually see how the work that they did over that 18 month period or however much however long it was has recovered that history and now that mm. that individual is is now uh, the, the example that I use is a project that I was involved in called um, do you remember Olive Morris uh, about a um, an activist uh, housing activist called Olive Morris that was based or that lived in Brixton 
I knew about Olive Rice because she was part of my family and I got involved in this uh, HLF funded project that was, um, I think it marks its 10th anniversary this year and they did a blog which kind of brought her very much into kind of public prominence and she um, she also takes a good picture so that it has, you know, the, the importance of the visual online and, and to see her go from somebody who, who was barely remembered locally to now somebody who's spoken about as being a national black heroine mm -hmm. over 10 years has been remarkable. And I think that is almost uh, primarily because of the high visibility of the information online. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the individuals that were involved or some of the individuals that were involved in that project 10 years ago are no longer around. And there's a kind of core group of people who are acting as custodians uh, for that. Um, history but oftentimes that isn't the case and I think um, as some of the news last year around uh, the feminist library having to leave their premises or mm -hmm. black cultural archives um, uh, and the issues that they've had with funding only go to highlight um, w without all three corners of that triangle so to speak and even you know the public library mm -hmm. our local libraries and, and archive system as well as being uh, woefully underfunded without all corners of that being represented, I think it's always going to be a rather difficult situation. And it depends on the kind of budget of love yeah. that um, <laughs> yeah. uh, that individual is going to. Oh, okay. yeah. that's, that's the job who works for Ruckus. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, just kind of, I should say that before Crim Brighton Archive was in my office, it was a, in a basement in a pub in, in, in Brighton. And before the reanimating data was on a hard drive or being tra uh, transferred, they were in computers in a in a house in an, uh, an attic in a house in London. You know, mm -hmm. so you know, recovery is actually physical recovery yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Do we have any more questions? We exhausted our questions. Oh um. Okay. So. <sighs> I have a question that's kind of been half formulated. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I can formulate So, so I think it's, so the, um, like data and those person, as personal identifiers, as it were. So I think it's interesting um, the way we, we consider some things that are connected with a person to potentially be problematic in terms of um, ethics and releasing information about them, but that we don't consider other uh, so objects that mm -hmm. the person loved for example but right now that we probably wouldn't see an, an issue with releasing um, those but as we um, it's not hard to see in the coming years as objects become interconnected the same way as data can be and those sort of um, uh, those other identifiers of the person there's a whole new plane of um, of this and of these interconnections and so I don't know I think I'm maybe we just have to move towards some sort of radical openness because we're not going to end up anywhere else. But that kind of leads into the question I was half formulating. Okay. Because <laughs> I was thinking about we've spoken a lot thus far about care right and not causing harm and I'm also thinking that we have a lot of harm that exists in and, and Kelly sort of mm. sort of point this out quite starkly in the terms of the sorts of data that exists that we have to create new data in order to push back against. And I think this is this feels like a crux for me, which is that we have we need to push back against certain knowledges and yet we want to protect people who we work with. And how do we resolve that? How do we work between those two those, those two kind of registers? Because otherwise the knowledge that exists is just gonna keep perpetuating and be that kind of reinforced knowledge that ends up on the front page of Google every time you search. How do we, how do, we do that? How do we get around that? The Savoy Saw report, the restitution report that um, the French government commissioned, uh, um, in the section that they have in, in, where they were considering the kind of digital uh, surrogates that might be created from some of these objects that um, uh, were stolen from Africa that the French government is now considering repatriated. It encourages a radical practice of sharing, is what it says, including rethinking the politics of image rights use. Obviously, there it's kind of concentrated on image rights. Um, I, I get I get quite nervous. I don't know if it's nervous, but cautious 
about how academia uses the term decommunisation. Um, because to me, uh, that is uh, a dismantling of all power structures. And essentially for academia, especially in Europe, it means a, a, um, uh, a, a complete, um, what's the word, a relinquishment of power and, and handing the power into where the authority lies and, and letting that rest elsewhere. Um, so I think in order to rise to that challenge about what is what are the new knowledges that need to be formed, how are they structured and how do they work? Um, I think first of all, it's 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 it, it needs some uncomfortable conversations about where the power resides in in how that knowledge is organised, how it's represented, how it's preserved, um, um, and that needs to be a uh, and who and who is at the table making those decisions? And that needs to be, you know, that needs to be a sustained initiative, not a kind of uh, uh, one of project or, or approach. Um, yeah, it, 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 yeah. To, to me, decolonisation means it means a, a dismantlement of the world as we know it. So <laughs> that is a big project. Um, it's a it's a multi generational project, even of course. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I think if, if it is something that the world is going towards, and I would hope that it is, to build a kind of more equitable uh, society. I think it's one that's worth engaging. Questions online, yeah? Uh, no, that was it. That was only online. <laughs> Do you have any questions for each other? Before we close? <laughs> I have a question <laughs> about the. Uh, you did Creative Commons licensing um, for the All Histories. What license did you go for? Um, so, non commercial, um, no derivative, and then the acknowledging the person. Um, so, uh, you know, immediately using non commercial cost on a whole lot of ways that they can potentially be used. Um, so, it was quite, uh, I guess, I went for the most conservative. Um, option of those that were available. Um, and I think if interviewees were willing, I would like to suggest that we could open it much further in the future. Um, yeah, but that's, yeah, that's really what I had with it. And were those, did you put those online as well, or was that just considered a. Yeah, it's all. Uh, so there's. Um, at the moment, most of the uh, audio and most of the transcripts are online. Some are in the book that I showed, some are in journals, and then there's a further uh, book on its own. And how do you think the licensing has affected its use or um, its priority? Or... Well, the book, so in terms of downloads, the book has done, at least to me, it's seemed amazingly well. So the book has had something like 70,000 downloads. Um, and it was published at the end of 2016. Um, now, you know, I feel sort of like sort of slightly unconstructed. Oh, my website has had 2,000 hits, yes, but in how long have people stayed? And has people, you know, but, <laughs> and, but the citations are coming in as well, so that indicates people are um, also reading it. Um, but already yesterday, I um, saw a colleague who's um, working on another book, and they would have liked to reuse one of the interviews in the, and because there's obviously a non-commercial um, stipulation on it, then we have to um, restart this whole process of permissions again. Um, so that's limiting. Um, and it would also be nice to think about, you know, remixing and... Uh, but again, this is... I think it has to be always on a case-by-case -case basis, as we said. Um, and it seems that going for a reasonably restricted licence, then we can sort of force that these things are discussed on a case by case basis as opposed to just as it is, um, into the wild as it were. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, a tiny follow up to that, which is a, probably a bit of a technical question. I don't know the answer, or even maybe the beginning of the answer, but it's about the Creative Commons licenses, which of course is very useful for this sort of thing. But I uh, kind of lost track of where things have got to, but it's the moral rights issue that's related to the Creative Commons and the Creative Commons 4.0 um, part of the contract is give up your moral rights and it mm -hmm. sort of struck me as that's quite a complicated thing, particularly in relation to these issues. 
and it's something that isn't really understood in the start way, it's never really been resolved. Um, I just wonder if any comments on on that or where where, where we are in, in that in the, in the Muslims of Creative Commons. And it's mm. potentially my technical point, but it's also potentially quite an important point, uh, asking participants mm. to give up their moral rights to their, their contribution. I mean, that feels deeply unethical, doesn't it? Because the, the foundation of ethics is that, you know, it's a moral code. Um, so you type, yeah, you've essentially given up your trust to third party to uh, exercise your rights for you. And I, I suppose, you know, the reason I was a bit numb when you asked for more questions is I was thinking through power structures uh, after your question and the extent to which a lot of the infrastructures we're talking about are created um, in terms of their power and... I suppose that's that's the other thing we have to contend with in terms of thinking about ethics, isn't it? That that we're not taking too much for granted in terms mm. of how structures make decisions for us. That's actually at the moment they're sort of algorithmically invisible. And I suppose mm. another point, point sorry, lead on for that as it is that and it's going to be other points about people access to knowledge and so on, access to the legal knowledge to understand this even if I just get to institutions, it is, is limited. Mm. Um, and so two, two, two things on that I should uh, um, out myself, so to speak. I am also the UK lead for the Creative Commons chapter, which just restarted last summer. Um, so you can all join if you contribute to the Commons, if you like. But I think that, that um, what you mentioned about education and actually be contributing to these conversations in an informed way, um, is a significant gap, especially when, I'll go back to it again, especially when working with voluntary and community organisations who are getting HLF funding and who are expected to, uh, for their digital outputs to be licensed under Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. And most voluntary organisations have, no, have no idea about copyright at all, let alone mm -hmm. about Creative Commons. And again, there isn't the structures in which to, um, uh, currently there aren't the structures in which to support that, um, the, um, uh, the growth of, of that knowledge around intellectual property and the possibilities of it within the voluntary sector, let alone anything else. Um, I, I think it's a huge issue. I think uh, it's, it's sort of data, um, digital literacy as well as intellectual property literacy is a, is a fundamental way of the way that we live our lives in the 21st century. So um, it, it, it kind of, um, in thinking about your work and in, in looking at, at social media and how so much we, we give away so much of our intellectual property mm -hmm. in how we kind of maneuver and communicate online um, without reading the terms and conditions and without kind of delving too deeply into um, what happens, how the the corporate machinery, what, what it does with that, um, with uh, the stuff that we create. Um, I think they're hugely pressing um, issues uh, generally. And then also in with that, point of power and what is the role of, of institutions in how it restricts the data it, it creates, whether it, that's through uh, digitising um, uh, material that is uh, out of copyright and that has ascended into the public domain and um, uh, restricting that with <coughs> uh, spurious copyright um, uh, marks. I think all of those are pressing issues to the things that we're talking about today around um, how how these can be effectively used to make knowledge more equitable and more accessible. Um, you know, it goes back to that thing where just because you stick online doesn't necessarily mean it's more accessible. There has to be more mm. fundamental things mm. uh, uh, done than that. And I think knowledge around intellectual property is an important part of it. We have no final comments or questions, I suggest you close. So can we do yeah. <laughs> yeah. so by thanking our speakers? Okay, I have three notices. Oh, can someone turn off the live stream? I have three notices. So the first one is that we have another Seven around two time in Rockstar from Cambridge. We talk about the textbook project. Uh, this is on 18th century English medical records. Um, a collection of